to the Debka File, a weekly roundup of exclusive news, insight, and analysis from the Middle East, broadcast to you live from the heart of the region. Coming up on the program today, the U.S. and Turkey make Putin delay key Idlib offensive. Erdogan forges his own deal with Putin at Sochi. Syrian crisis may unfold into U.S. attack on Iranian nuclear sites. First U.S. planes deployed to the Gulf and the Red Sea. Palestinians rebuffed by U.S. Democrats. And now to our top headlines. The U.S. notified Russia that the Trump administration would pursue military intervention in Syria, not only in response to Bashar Assad's use of chemical weapons in Idlib, but also for a ground offensive. This warning stopped the Idlib operations in its tracks. Russia, Iran and Syria had been ready to go with this offensive after the Russian Air Force battered the rebel stronghold for several days. Washington also warned Moscow that it would hold Russia accountable for the potential disaster caused by such joint action in Idlib. If it occurred, the U.S. would put more sanctions on Russia. Moscow threatened to hit back for U.S. military intervention at American sites east of the Euphrates River as the U.S. increased marine forces around its Altant base and staged a military exercise there. Erdogan, who made a deal with U.S. Special Envoy to Syria, James Jeffrey, last week, agreed to support Washington in its demands of Moscow. Ankara increased the pressure on three allies against attacking Idlib by adding extra Turkish obstacles in Idlib and by arming pro-Turkish rebel groups. Debka reports that the U.S. and Turkey coordinated their strategy against the Russian-Iranian Syrian alignment in Syria. Erdogan turned against the deal he had reached with Russian President Putin and Iranian President Rouhani at the Tehran summit on September 7th. Erdogan praised the deal at the time. Şu anda üzerinde durmak istediğim İdlib'teki bombardımanların artık bir ateş kese. Şu anda adım atılmasında büyük fayda var. Zira şu anda İdlib halkı ciddi manada bir korku, bir sivil halkı kastediyorum. Değerli dostlar, bizler İdlib'e odaklanırken ve dünya gözlerini buraya çevirmişken Fırat'ın doğusunda arzu etmediğimiz gelişmeler yaşanıyor. Bir takım yabancı güçlerin bölgede Yaşla mücadele bahanesiyle attığı adımların artık bambaşka bir istikamete yöneldiği gizlenemez bir gerçektir. Artık DAEŞ tehdidi ve tehlikesi kalmamış olmasına rağmen Amerika'nın bölgede bir diğer terör örgütünü güçlendirmeye devam etmesinden fevkalade rahatsız. Since then, Turkish President Erdogan has been mapping out a separate arrangement with Russia and its allies over the Idlib question to prepare for their meeting today in Sochi. Erdogan has planned to press the advantage he gained from helping the U.S. compel the Russians to hold their joint offensive with Iran and Syria for recovering Idlib for the Assad regime. Putin will want to join the Russian-Iranian-Syrian offenses to progress soon. Tebka file intelligence sources report that Putin is giving Erdogan time to transfer his proxy, the most powerful Syrian rebel militia that holds an Idlib province to the northern districts adjacent to the Turkish border. This Russian-Turkish deal offers advantages to both sides. The removal of the province from central Idlib will ease the Russian-Iranian-Syrian offensive for capturing Syria's largest province from the rebels and remove the rebel militia, which has plagued the Russian airbase at Khmemim with drone attacks. Turkey is allowed to consolidate its foothold on Syria's northern border while limiting the actions of U.S.-backed Kurdish militias in the American interest, as well as deterring their struggle for autonomy. Debka file reports discussions in Washington over a possible military attack on Iran's nuclear sites. October is cited as a possible month before Iran's economy has time to recover from its current crisis and before the next round of sanctions in November. Russian President Vladimir Putin has pledged to help Iran overcome the sanctions, and Trump does not want to wait for this to take place. Trump has learned from the North Korean summit that preventing a country from nuclearizing is easier than dealing with it after the fact. 
Last week, Iran began lifting its currency out of free fall against the dollar by adopting the cryptocurrency program. As a result, Bitcoin soared to a record high on the cryptocurrency exchange. The Secretary of Iran's Supreme Council of Cyberspace said a national cryptocurrency will be used to finance transactions with foreign trading partners instead of Western financial systems. Iran is also using its $150 billion foreign currency reserve on projects to sidestep the U.S. sanctions. $500 billion will set up the government-owned foreign investments company, which has begun buying assets that give the country direct access to services, goods and funds in 22 countries. These include a French medicine factory, an Afghan trading house, a Brazilian auto parts plant and a German pipeline factory. President Putin has given Iran full access to Russian resources in order to neutralize U.S. sanctions and restate his commitment to Iranian President Rouhani during his visit to Tehran last Friday. Iran, Russia and Syria are attempting to turn Damascus into a hub for Iranian commerce and a supply center for Iran. Trump is rushing to take decisive action against Iran's nuclear capabilities in view of a recent drop in his approval rating and ahead of the midterm elections this November. Aware of the impending threat, Iran's national security advisor, Ali Shamkhani, has responded by saying that, quote, any hostile measure against our country will be responded to by Tehran tenfold. We're capable of protecting ourselves in every field. Iranian Ambassador Kazem Garabibadi had this to say at an International Atomic Energy Agency conference about the 2015 nuclear deal. While appreciating the strong support of the international community to the deal, which was also expressed by the overwhelming majority of the states in the today's meeting, the Islamic Republic of Iran has always expressed loud and clear that if the deal is to survive, Iran should also be benefited from the deal. It would be a great shame if the achievement of 12 years of multilateral diplomacy would be shattered by irresponsible behavior of just one state. U.S. Naval Air and Marines forces have launched an offensive from the East African country Djibouti, opposite the Red Sea, to prepare for a clash with Iran. Debka military sources report that they're focusing on the Iranians' blocking of the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf and Bab al-Mandeb Strait in the Red Sea. 4,500 U.S. Marine troops are taking part in the operation, practicing confrontations with Iranian naval and air forces in the Persian Gulf and Red Sea, and testing their emergency rapid response capabilities, as well as their ob ability to operate in waters filled with sea mines. The Marine Fighter Attack Squadron 211, made up of F-35s, which is capable of vertical takeoff from U.S. aircraft carriers, is also taking part in the exercise. The U.S. fleet and the Israeli Air Force now cover the region from the Strait of Hormuz up to the Syrian coast. Devka file reports that the Palestinians appealed to U.S. Democrats to use their case against Donald Trump in their midterm election campaigns. However, their bid failed. Operation Democratic Party was launched by Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas at his Ramallah headquarters and instructed Palestinian officials to approach Democratic contacts to target Trump's anti-Palestinian agenda in the midterm elections. The list was created by the head of the PLO's Washington office, Hussan Zamlot, along with Foreign Minister Riyad al-Maliki and Palestinian diplomat Saeb Erekat, who had this to say about the U.S. being a peace broker for the Middle East. But how can anyone in their sane mind, with all these American decisions, Trump's decisions, believe that these people can be honest brokers, facilitators, arbitrators in any peace process? They are no longer partners in the peace process. Our uh, representative, Ambassador Zumlut, was recalled in May. You recall, we recalled him in May. President Abbas recalled him when they moved the embassy. He's still here. He never been there. And now the interests of the uh, Palestinians, uh, especially on uh, consular issues, will will be served maybe through one of the Arab embassies or the Arab League uh, there, as the customary with all other nations. The Palestinians were optimistic that the select group of Democrats would support and rally behind the Palestinians after Trump shut down the PLO office in Washington and cut funding to UNRWA. Trump senior advisor Jared Kushner and chief legal advisor Jason Greenblatt have accused the agency of encouraging the Palestinian refugee status and allowing it to include far more people than originally intended. 
The two envoys have recommended putting aside the idea of a Palestinian state and offering them semi-independent status in confederation with Jordan. Abbas and his officials were confident that the Democrats, including Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, would support them in light of Trump's recent decisions. However, all the Democrats replied with a negative response and declined to put the Palestinian cause in their election campaigns. Rather, they replied that, quote, it's not up to us to fight your war. Meanwhile, Israeli officials have been reacting positively to Trump's decisions in regards to the Palestinians. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Israeli Transportation Minister Yisrael Katz had this to say at a recent cabinet meeting. ישראל מעריכה מאוד את החלטת ממשל טראמפ ותומכת בפעולות האמריקניות שנועדו להעביר לפלסטינים שהסירוב להיכנס למסע ומתן עם ישראל והמתקפות משולחות הרסן נגד ישראל לא רק שלא יקדמו את השלום, הם בוודאי גם לא יטיבו עם הפלסטינים. החלטת נשיא ארצות הברית היא החלטה מצוינת לסגור את משרדי אש"ף בוושינגטון. זה מצטרף להחלטה על הכרה בירושלים כבירת ישראל. ההחלטה להפסיק את מימון אונר"ס, זה הארגון להנצחת זכות השיבה המדומה של הפליטים. כל הצעדים האלה הם בעצם יורדים לשורשי הסכסוך ואומרים לאבו מאזן שהוא לא יכול להמשיך בכפל הלשון שלו. With us in the studio to discuss this is Dr. Mordechai Kedal, lecturer at Bar Ilan University and an expert on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Thanks so much for joining us today. Honor. Let's open with the tragedy that occurred yesterday with a uh, stabbing and subsequent death of pro-Israeli activist Ari Fold. Does the murder of Ari Fold show an idea of security lapse in Judea and Samaria? And do you think there's an escalation in terror? Well, we have to look at the timeline of what, what happened and what will happen. Uh, I think that uh, it might have been a unique uh, event. Doesn't necessarily have to be followed by more events like this. However, we have to still remember that uh, these actions, if they are carried out by one person, each of them, it means that they actually look at the TV, look at the social media, and they are encouraged by what they see to go and do it again and again. What we call in Hebrew fashion uh, uh, terrorist attacks. And this, yes, this can be, because uh, uh, the more they see it, the more they see all kinds of pamphlets which are being produced by people praising what this killer did, it might encourage others, especially if they are also exposed to the social media. What do you think the Israeli government will do about this, uh, and uh, what are the options left? Well, uh, what I know is the government definitely tries to monitor the websites like Facebook, Twitter, and uh, maybe they also have some access to uh, WhatsApp uh, as well. Telegram maybe as well, although these sites are ciphered. Uh, yet, I have a reason to believe that uh, they do know what happens in these places, because uh, th I, I think that in the recent, let's say, two or three years, the social media actually plays a major role in convincing people like the guy who yesterday stabbed Ari Fould, Hashem Ikon Damo. Uh, I think that the social media here plays a major role in inciting these kids, these youngsters, in order to follow what others did successfully, unfortunately. Let's move to our uh, story. W what options are left for Abbas uh, after burning his bridges with Washington? Well, not much, because uh, today I think that the whole uh, house of cards which the Palestinians tried to build through the last uh, 50 years, um, which is made of the cards of Jerusalem, which belongs to them according to their narrative, uh, to the return of the old refugees, to the fact that they will actually topple the whole state of Israel and, and build a Palestine uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, as they say in their demonstrations. And some more of, this, uh, of these cards, like the Arab world stands behind the Palestinians in every issue. All these things today t 
turned to be nothing. Jerusalem was taken, and actually it became, by the uh, definition of at least the United Nations, the United States, it is the Israeli capital. So Jerusalem is not anymore on the negotiations table. Secondly, the refugees. Now America doesn't give money to UNRWA. Uh, if the Arab world jumps, doesn't jump in with many millions of uh, dollars, and the Europeans as well, UNRWA might be dismantled, and the whole uh, issue of the Palestinian refugees will dissolve within a few years. So uh, when, when he sees that every card which he used in order to build this building made of cards uh, is taken and um, thrown out from the equation by the Americans, um, he actually is losing everything. Not only losing the relations with America, he is losing with the relations with his own people. And don't forget that Abu Mazen, for example, he was not born here. He was born in Tzfat, which is in the Galilee. He is viewed as totally illegitimate in Judea and Samaria, not to mention Gaza. Well, in the first visit which he made, like more than 10 years ago in Gaza, the bullet passed 10 centimeters near his face and killed one of his uh, bodyguards. So he knows that he is persona non grata in Gaza and in many places on Judea and Samaria as well. So to say that there is a prospect for a Palestinian state will, will, which will be viewed as legitimate, this is as far as could be from the reality, Don't, not, not to mention the possibility that Hamas might take the Palestinian state by elections, as already happened in 2006, and people in the Judea and Samaria, the Arabs, will start to have to face the same problems which Gaza faces. Nobody wants it. So the whole thing about Palestinian statehood today is viewed as much less likely to happen uh, than how it was 25 years ago when the Oslo agreements uh, were signed and the hearts were full of hopes. Today, the reality actually uh, covered everything, and very few people here, especially in Israel, uh, really want to see a Palestinian independence which might turn into a terror state. In light of the funding cuts uh, from the U.S., do you think the European or Arab governments will step in with aid to replace these cuts? Um, definitely. Qatar uh, will uh, put money, especially in Gaza, because they are good friends of Hamas. And if they see prospects to a uh, winning of Hamas in Judea and Samaria, they might pour money also in that area in order to promote the chances that Hamas wins in Judea and Samaria as well. Uh, Qatar here definitely plays a very, very problematic role, and unfortunately, Israel allows it in a way or another. And then the, the, the Emirates, Saudi Arabia might put some money. Uh, Egypt doesn't have money, so Egypt cannot do it, but uh, they can facilitate all kinds of things when it comes to Gaza, like opening the uh, Rafiah gate and other things. So all, all in all, I don't see now the Arab world fills the gap which the Americans opened by stopping the money to, to the Palestinian Authority, yet Qatar might do it partially. Do you think the Trump peace plan uh, has any chance to succeed? The peace plan which was made by the White House, uh, I think, was already rejected by the Arab world. Um, overwhelmingly. Uh, they have no intention, not the Palestinians, not others, to follow the American uh, uh, dictates as they see it, because they don't see the Americans as honest brokers anymore. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this uh, actually, in my view, actually buries this peace plan before it was born. Um, and after all, look, in the Middle East, when things are too complicated and have to involve too many parties, the chances for the uh, uh, success are very low. Here in the Middle East, you have to step small steps, uh, every step at a, at a time, and to see how this step succeeded or not. Uh, to, to come with a major plan which will solve all the problems, this is something which, in my view, 
uh, is too much to uh, absorb or to digest in this very problematic uh, area. That's Dr. Mordechai Kedal. Thank you very much for your insight today. Pleasure. And now for a roundup of this week's regional headlines you may have missed, the news in brief. The European Investment Fund, EIF, has announced that it will make a $20 million investment to Israeli clean tech ventures, a capital fund in Renana that focuses on providing growth capital to Israel's energy, water, environment and industrial technology sectors. So this will be the first equity investment of the EIF in an Israeli venture capital fund. The firm's fund will invest in Israeli companies that are developing innovation that enhance resources and sustainability. According to a 2018 U.S. traffic safety report, deaths from motorcycle accidents are 28 times more likely than car accidents. The Israeli company Ride Vision, founded by Uri Lavi and Lior Cohen, are working to increase the safety of riding motorcycles. They just raised $2.5 million for its patented collision aversion technology, which combines artificial intelligence with neural networks and threat detection. An Afghan man has sent the fifth child from Afghanistan to Israel for life-saving heart surgery through the Save a Child's Heart Foundation, an Israeli charity based at the Wolfson Medical Center in Cholon. The organization is the first Israeli NGO to win a UN Population Award and has so far treated 4,800 children from 57 countries, as well as Gaza and the Palestinian territories. That's all for this week's edition of The Debka File. We'll be back with you next week for more exclusive news, insight, and analysis from the Middle East. Thanks for watching.